but it's not perfect yet because in some ways we're still ascribing function to lumps and bumps. Now we're doing a little bit better of a job that now it's actually on the brain. But uh, so it really was, in, I think, with animal models, uh, again, in the 70s and 80s where we started to really kind of become, uh, where we started to learn how information is encoded in the brain. And, uh, and, that, and really with some of the monkey models in the 80s, and I would like to go through just a brief example of that, where when they started putting microelectrodes into, uh, into the cortex of brains where they started to learn how the brain is actually encoding information. And just to give you, an, this is one of the first examples of that, a kind of a famous gentleman by the name of Georgopoulos. And he did a fairly simple experiment. He had electrodes in, in the monkey motor cortex. And what he had the monkey do is he had it manipulate this thing called a manipulandum. Basically a simple articulated arm. And the monkey, and you can see his arm right here, basically had to do what's called a center out task. And what that involved was basically moving from the center of the, uh, the, the screen here to some peripheral target which you see circled. And here's actually the tracings that the monkey drew out. And you can see it's at zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees. And when you actually looked at the um, neuronal firing rate, you ba what they basically found was that for a certain direction for that particular neuron, it had a, essentially a directional preference. And when you, not to get you know, too involved in this, but when you regress that to a line, it formed a cosine curve. And they, they started to refer to this as cosine tuning, meaning that basically for a given neuron, it had a directional predilection. And that when it wanted to go, when it fired at a rapid rate, that would predict the monkey's arm movements. And when you looked at a whole bunch of neurons together, you could actually predict very precisely in three-dimensional space where that monkey wanted to move his arm. And this is just a kind of a graphical representation of that. And each of those lines represents the action of potential firing rate. And it's kind of like a bunch of neurons voting, and the loudest guy voting seems to you know, kind of predominate. So again, looking at this, you can kind of appreciate some of the implications for this for somebody with the uh, severe motor disabilities. Now, so that was single unit systems. Now also, again, going back to these uh, uh, electrical rhythms from the scalp, again, we, we were able back then to get very simple um, signals for whether the motor cortex was active or not active, depending on how these uh, frequency, certain frequency bands, bands changed in amplitude. And so again, we could use that as a signal for very simple device control. And let me show you an example of that. Whoops. And again, the, this guy has a, uh, oops. can you see my mouth? Oh, I guess not, there we go, oh, keeps him disappearing. But he's got an electrode cap on, those are again, recording signals from the surface of his brain, and he can control the cursor whether it goes right or left, based on motor imagination. Got to work at it a little bit here, but eventually he gets it. 